Thanks, everyone. Uh, big shout out to whoever just had the new pornographers on. Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, my name is Paul McAleer, and I am a UX manager at RightPoint, which is an agency based in Chicago and with offices in Denver and Detroit. I also host a podcast called Designing Yourself. I'm also a writer, speaker, punter, and probably about 50,000 other things, too, that don't fit on the slide. And I'm super happy that you're all with me here today. So what we're going to be doing is talking about design, which is one of my favorite things to do. And we're going to discuss what happens when you apply the principles and tools and practices that we use in design, designing products, websites, and et cetera, and applying that to your life. What does that look like? What are the activities like? And how do you do things like get solid feedback and do experiments? Those are things we're going to be discussing today. But first, I want to start with a case study for a project that really got me thinking about this topic. So a number of years ago, I was approached by a potential client. And uh, they said, hey, we need UX, which made me super happy because I love UX. I love doing this work. Um, and I said, cool, I can do that. Uh, we started talking about what the project was going to entail. And they said, well, a lot. Um, we don't have a designer today, but we think we need a designer for this thing overall. It's kind of a new thing for us. And I said, OK. I was a little skeptical, but I was like, all right, this is cool. Um, they said, oh, yeah, and we also have a lot of stakeholders in this project, like dozens of stakeholders who really all need to be satisfied in some way when it comes to designing this stuff. And I said, OK, that sounds pretty good. I'm, I'm interested, but it's challenging. And they also said, oh, and, and also, by the way, there's this kind of concern that a lot of these stakeholders have about fear and getting things done. And, and so you, you have to be aware of that. You know, I said, you don't really have to solve it, but you have to be ready for that. And I said, sign me up. That sounds great. <laughs> it sounds like a really scary, fun project. And so I started and took on this client, took on this project. So let me tell you a little about the kickoff when we went into it. Um, so when they came to me and said they needed UX, the truth was that they needed a lot more than that. They really needed all the big phases of design. They needed a discovery process. They needed a strategy. They needed to execute. They needed feedback. They needed all of those things, for sure. So that made me kind of happy. Uh, they also kind of needed a project manager. So that meant that I would have to crack open probably a Microsoft project and do some Gantt charts, which I kind of love. Um, so that made me happy, too. Um, but it was, it was interesting to see like it wasn't just this simple little thing that they wanted and needed. They needed a lot more than that, too. So I started the project with stakeholder interviews. And I've, I've done a lot of stakeholder interviews in my career. I've been fortunate enough to do that. And you, know, you get down to a process with this stuff. There's a set of questions you ask about success and measuring it and what the project's going to look like in the end and how important it is to the company as well. And those ser serve kind of as that solid basis. So I went into these discussions with these questions. It's really what, what this was about and what the meaning of this whole project was. And I was really surprised because these were the most emotional sets of stakeholder interviews I had ever experienced. These people were clearly very heavily invested in this project. They really wanted it to succeed. And they cared deeply about it, even though there were all sorts of flaws and things wrong with these stakeholders, too. And that was something that really stuck with me through this process. So let me share with you some of the findings from these interviews. So the first thing was that there was a lot of fear. There was a whole lot of fear amongst these stakeholders. With these people, they really had a sense of, I want to do something interesting. I want to do something great. But nobody was really willing to make that first leap. Nobody really wanted to say, I will be the one to go ahead and make this change and, and break that. Because the status quo is pretty comfortable. It's a comfortable place to be. It doesn't ruffle any feathers. Nobody wanted that. Uh, there was also this idea of capabilities and kind of a mismatch on that, too. The people who were in this project felt like they couldn't do some things. They just couldn't do that or that they shouldn't do those things. But in truth, other people that were involved in this process were capable of doing this stuff. And in fact, some of them wanted to do it, which was really fascinating to see, too. 
And the other thing that really stuck with me as well is that you know, reaching back to the first time I talked with this potential client, they said, you know, we're doing a lot of, uh, we're doing a lot of shipping of stuff, but we're not doing a lot of thinking. And, and I realized, well, they, they weren't doing any design thinking either. They didn't really have any big long-term goals. They had a lot of things that were, you know, day to day, like they knew what they were shipping today and next week, but there really wasn't a sense of what they were building towards. So it felt kind of monotonous overall. All right, folks, so I have to confess something to you right now. This project is not a project at all. This project is me. Um, this, this whole thing is me. Um, so you might be wondering, oh, wait, 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 wait. What about things like stakeholder interviews and a client kickoff? Like, did you really do that? Well, I confess I didn't have a client kickoff. That would be a little weird. But as far as stakeholders go, stakeholders were real in this case. The so stakeholders were parts of me. They were friends and family and colleagues and people that I worked with as well. Um, so they all had a say in this matter. They truly did. And one other thing to point out is that this fear, this sense of powerlessness and not having those long-term goals, that was something that was absolutely real when it came time to approach this whole thing. So when things continued and I confronted this idea, I started wondering, if there was something I could take from this design work I was doing during the day in my day job, which I love, and apply towards myself. And I realized, well, these buckets that we use to go through this process are actually kind of applicable. And the way I define design is in this set of stages. There's the research, which can be also be called discovery, where you're kind of finding things out. There's a strategy, where you're making plans on how you're going to, how you're going to do things like execution. Then you execute or you experiment, if you will, and then you gather feedback. And you kind of repeat that process. You kind of go into a circle with that. So this is where we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be spending some time with each one of these areas and seeing how, seeing how these things all fit together. Now, one thing I want to point out is that I hate self-help books. I hate them because it's the sense of here is somebody who has gotten their life right and now is going to write a tome that I'm going to read and take from and suddenly everything's going to be better for me. So I encourage you to join me with some skepticism even in my own talk here because honestly um, the way I see it is that we are taking everything in in our lives. You know, the talks you've already heard today, talks you're going to hear tomorrow, the workshops you might have been in a couple days ago, the coffee you had this morning. All this stuff comes together, we take it in, and then we put something else out in the world. We're essentially always remixing all this stuff that we have in our lives and putting it back out in the world as our own thing. So I hope that there are some things that you find today that you can apply right away. Some things you might have to stew on a little bit. There might be a few things where you're like, mm, not for me. But in any case, Hope you find some good stuff here today. So let's dive in. Uh, first thing we're going to talk about is research. And I used to not do design research, which was a weird place to be, especially in UX. It was like, don't talk to people, kind of a weird, weird way to do UX work. But one thing I've realized within design is that, man, we love frameworks, right? We love frameworks and thinking about frameworks. That's very geeky, fun stuff. So when it comes to this, one of the ways that I decided to break down, like how, how am I going to approach designing myself, is to break myself down into these three parts. We have the drivers, which are kind of the things that really motivate us. I, don't, I might almost call this heart and gut. That would be another way to approach this as well. There's the mind, and there's the body as well. And for a long time, these were very separate for me. That was something I noticed right away. The way that I saw what was driving me versus my mind and my body, very separate things. Didn't see how they played together, but you'll see through some research that they actually do play a lot together. Starting with those drivers. So I talked early on about the fear and what was going on there. And the truth was is that I was afraid a lot. There were a lot of things that I wanted to do in my life. There were a lot of things I wanted to say, but I always was afraid of what the other person would do or say in that situation. Um, for instance, during high school, uh, there might have been times when friends and I would go out and we'd just go get a bite to eat, and somebody might ask me, even on a small interaction, uh, where do you want to go? And I would say, I don't know or I don't care, in deference to them. Even though I clearly had an opinion, I had a sense of, you know, yeah, I, I don't want to go to Taco Bell for the 287th time this week, high school, um, but I might want to go somewhere else. But I never really gave myself the chance to speak up because I was afraid of how they would react. So that held me back. 
And for the longest time, I justified this within myself by saying, oh, I'm just abstaining from decision here, right? I'm not making a choice in the matter. I'm not putting a say in the matter. But the truth is, is that not choosing to do something is actually a design choice. That's something I've had to say to clients a couple times in the real world, real clients too, is that we can do all this research and then they can decide not to act on it. That's a perfectly acceptable way of doing it. So I want to talk about running a little bit and the body and start with the mind. Here are a couple chuckles. I'm not sure why. Um, so uh, about five years ago or so, I took up running which absolutely surprised me because to me it sounds like one of the most boring things you could ever do. I mean, I'm gonna go out and run and that's it. And that's it? Like, that's all there is to it? That seems really boring, and especially when you do it on a treadmill, which is where I started. It's like I'm running in place. I'm not going anywhere. I'm just in the same spot. It sounded ridiculous to me. But nevertheless, I tried it out and I found out I really, really liked it, which totally surprised me. Started talking with my wife about it a little bit. I was like, yeah, I'm kind of getting into this a little bit. And uh, she said, well, I, are you going to become an asshole? And, and I said, well, what, what do you mean? And uh, she and I got to talking. And what had happened is that actually both of us had had experiences with runners, some online and some in real life, where they were assholes. Um, they were super mean to other people. They were mean to people who weren't running or people who had different body types than they did. It was just kind of a bad atmosphere. And we'd seen that in a couple of acquaintances who took up running too. Like they, they took on kind of these jerky qualities that were not really great. So my wife, clearly, you know, she didn't want me to become an asshole. I didn't want to become one either. So in talking about it, we came up with an agreement and said, okay, if this happens, then we've got to check each other on this. We've got to be sure that you know, if you see that behavior in me, or I see that in myself, that we say, you know, hey, hang on, call me out on it. That's super important. Um, but where, the, where this went for me, though, was this idea that for the longest time, I had this idea in my head, that runners are assholes. Runners equals assholes. And so me being in that equation, taking on that label, meant that, ooh, am I now an asshole? No, I don't think I am anyway. Um, I, it's something that means that for me, now that I have this as part of my identity, some of you may totally agree with this. You may be sitting there thinking, yes, runners are assholes. He's right, this is a great talk. And others of you might be sitting there thinking, no way, I run all the time, I'm really nice. And some of you probably don't care. Um, but for me, it was just understanding that this label has some weight with it. It has some ideas, and you're gonna have your own ideas about the labels that you have about other people. You bring those in the conversation, and for me, it was to get to a place where that's good for me to know, but it's also not going to drive me. And one of the places that we see this label problem, as it were, and thinking about our identity is Twitter, of all places. Um, so as you know, Twitter uh, gives you 140 characters for stuff. We saw that in Donna's talk. Um, they give you 160 for your bio. Not quite sure what the origin of that is, but those 20 extra characters count somehow. Uh, and what I've seen in looking at my own bio over the years is a pretty clear trend. Um, I try to really distill myself down into this 160 character bit. And it's really hard to do. I usually have something about my job. Um, I have something about my dog sometimes, or my son, or my wife. Um, I might put in things like photographer, baker, and I started to try to be a little more funny and put some comical stuff in there. Sometimes that does not work. Uh, but really, just over time, it was, I was noticing that it was really hard to encapsulate this into 160 characters. So I started writing down all of these attributes that I thought of about myself, and I came up with something like this, which is not done, and there's an ellipsis at the end. And there's a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of stuff here, and some of it absolutely represents big parts of me, and some are small parts of me. But they're all a part of my identity. And that's one of the important things, too, is that these labels are things that we take in and we make our own, no matter what other people may think. And getting to that point where people and their thoughts on it matters or doesn't matter is a very hard thing to do. Very hard thing. So I stole this totally from Donna. I'm happy to admit that because it was so great. Um, so my story growing up was this. I started in computers and was a computer programmer. And I was going to go to college and study computer science. After that, I was going to get, uh, I was going to get a degree, be super duper successful. 
uh, get a house in the suburbs, marry somebody, have 2.5 kids, have a dog, have a house with a white picket fence, have a fast car, all that stuff. And that really did not happen. Um, I noticed that first in college when I chose instead to go to art school. And I started in computer science at uh, University of Illinois Chicago. And boy, it bored me to tears, everybody. Um, it just wasn't something that was for me, ultimately. Um, and getting to that point of saying, like, wow, this story that's out there about me is not me. This is just something that I've taken in and tried to make my own, and this does not fit. This doesn't fit with who I am and who I want to be. The first time I started realizing that, I, was, I felt really strongly about that. I felt bad about that because I wasn't on this kind of ghost path of my life and where I was supposed to be. Now I was going somewhere else and nothing was defined. There was no clue where I was gonna go, how, how well it was gonna go, how poorly it could go. I was just in a place of worry initially. But really what I had to do was take out that emotion and just look at things realistically. I'm not, I'm not a comp sci major. I am not good at calculus, I'm not good at higher maths, and I might never be, but maybe someday in the future. But nevertheless, where I am now is a very, very different place. And just, again, taking that emotion out of it and saying, yeah, this is where I actually am today, and being realistic about it was a big changer for me, because the emotion really was what, what was making me feel bad about those decisions. So I've made decisions in my life, some are good, some are bad, but where I am now is most important. So, Let's try something together for a moment. I've been doing a lot of talking up here, and um, I know we're not too, too far from lunch right now, but uh, bear with me on this. What I'd like all of you to do is go ahead and close your eyes for a moment. I can see you up here, by the way. Okay, all right. Now everybody breathe very deeply for a moment. Okay, now open your eyes and look at your feet. Okay, now what I want you to do is think about where you just were before we started doing that. Now yeah, there's the, the quick answer, yeah, we're in the Melody Ballroom, got it. But were you really here listening or were there other things that were happening and going on in your mind? Were you tweeting? Were you writing something? Were you bored to tears? Were you thinking about lunch? Were you thinking about voodoo donuts? Maybe you were. Um, it's important in those moments to realize that we can be here physically and be somewhere else in our brains totally all together, okay? And the idea of looking at my feet is something that helps ground me. It helps me realize, no, 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 I am actually here right now. This is where I am in this moment. And that's something I picked up from Dr. Leslie Jensen Inman. Uh, she wrote an excellent pastry box article about this. And she uses that technique too, sometimes before she gives a talk or, or even when she's just feeling kind of up and not connected to what's going on. She'll look at her feet and that gives her that grounding sense, which I found really, really powerful. Now I have to admit, when it comes to this stuff, I was super skeptical, super skeptical. Um, because again, I was driven a lot by my mind, and my mind was like, there's no way this stuff all plays together, because the mind's in control, and it's great. Never mind the body. Um, and then I found the video, I was referred to uh, Amy Cuddy's video by a friend, and she is a social psychologist who has done a lot of research and presented in information in TED Talks about how body language shapes who you are and how you feel and how you perceive yourself. And again, the first time I saw this, totally skeptical. But I watched it and I was very curious about it. So, you know, I caught myself doing a power pose, which is this kind of, you know, hands on the hips type of pose and you kind of get your feet kind of strong and you take this kind of position. And I did and I felt better, which was very strange. Um, I was very, very confused by this. I was like, how can this really be? Does this really work? A couple weeks later, I was at work and I had to go see my boss and talk with him about something. Um, it was pretty heavy stuff. And he was on the opposite end of the floor from me. So what I had to do was I had to walk over to his office, as you do, right? And I started walking to his office like this. Does anyone notice the way that I'm walking? You can shout it out. What do you notice? What was that? Ooh, my head is down. Hmm? Looking at my feet, ooh, ooh, that's good. That's almost, that, I wasn't expecting that one, that's good. Um, yeah, my head is down and I'm looking at my feet, so I'm looking down. 
the other thing, my head is entering first into the space, right? So I had so much on my mind that was actually physically manifesting itself in me, which is crazy. Like I was, I was thinking so much that I went in my room with my brain first, which was really strange for me to realize. Had the conversation with my boss after that. Um, had a good conversation, again, it was heavy. But I had noticed this when I was walking on the way over, just the way my posture was and the way that I was standing. Like I paid attention to that. Got out of his office and realized I didn't want to walk that way. I kind of didn't want to. So I ended up trying something else, walking heart first. So I kind of puffed out my chest a little bit and then walked a little more like this. And you know, even doing it up here, I just feel 10 times more comfortable. It's more me and it's just, it's a physical manifestation of myself and what I care about. It's like I care about people. I care about that connection. So yes, that makes sense for me. But just that little shift was really significant for me. And I felt very different through the rest of the day. Now, another place I noticed this was in the car. So in my last job, I had a very long commute. I used to drive, uh, it was 60 minutes one way to the office and then 60 to 90 on the way home, which is a lot of time in the car. You get to know a lot of podcasts that way. Um, so in driving, you know, there was one day uh, during the winter when I was driving, road conditions were fine, everything was good. But I felt really kind of tense and I wasn't sure why. And then I looked at the way I was seated. And the first thing I noticed is that my knuckles were super tight on the wheel. Like I was, I was doing a death grip on this thing. And as far as the seat goes, I was leaning forward a little bit. So I was, I was up just a little bit. I wasn't comfortable at all, which looks a little scary. I was more like this, kind of engaged. And I also noticed that, of all things, my toes were curled. My toes were curled while I was driving. I was in a totally closed position, everybody. I was like this. I was like the crash position. And there was nothing going on. There, was no, there were no accidents. There was nothing else happening there. It was simply that default position I'd put myself in when I was driving, which was kind of strange. So what I did is I loosened up, loosened up my grip on the wheel. I was like, yeah, I'm not going to let go of the wheel. It's not going to fall off, hopefully. It's OK. Sat back a little bit and naturally uncurled my toes. And it gave me that reminder of like when I'm doing this type of stuff, I absolutely have to pay attention to the way my body is in space. It's huge because it actually does have an impact on me, which again, very much surprising to me at first. Breathing. So we all breathed just a moment ago. We're breathing right now, thankfully. Um, and when I meditate, when I run, breathing is extremely important. Keeping that type of pace, making sure you're doing it, um, that's something that we can bring into our moment and really focus on if we really want to, or we can just kind of let it slide and let it happen automatically as well. When my son gets really upset, um, he'll work himself up quite a bit. One of the things I tell him, take a deep breath. Let's relax together. We'll breathe together. That's really important. It gets us back to that current moment and gets us you know, kind of grounded again a little bit. Um, I use this... I use this now. I'm using it right now when I'm up here on stage. I've used it when I've given other presentations. I used it beforehand. Um, it's something that I've found to be a very useful little thing, is just to take a moment and breathe. Just notice what you're doing. Notice that stuff. Um, there's an excellent book by Suzuki Roshi called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind that was a profound influence for me. And in it, he equates breathing with a swinging door. You know, he gets into the point where it gets a little more into the, the philosophy side of it, where he talks about that it's not really, you know, there's no I and there's no you, there just is, which is fun stuff, I dig that. Um, but the whole idea of, yeah, you're just breathing, you're just letting everything in and everything out. I thought that was just a really, really cool idea. I really dig that. And I, that sticks with me when I'm doing breathing, when I'm, even when I'm running, when I'm like, you know, a total mess. I still try to keep that in mind. And then that influences the way that I breathe and the way I approach that as well. All right, let's talk strategery. So I will admit there is a part of me that would be absolutely thrilled to know what I'm doing on February 18th, 2019. I would love to know what time I'm getting up that day. I would love to know when I'm going to go to bed that day, but I totally don't. And there are parts of me that get so frustrated with that. So what I did is I had to enter into this gray area, right? I want to plan out my life, plan out what I'm going to do. And the compromise I made my, with myself was this, to make small plans and to be open in every moment. 
So the plans I was going to make, there are some big plans that I care about deeply and I'll try to work to in some ways. We'll talk about that in a minute. But smaller things that I know I can accomplish and feel strongly about, right? And the idea of being open in every moment is flexibility. Like, I don't want to be necessarily locked into what I'm doing on February 18th, 2019. Um, and I hope I can follow up with everybody on that and figure out what I'm doing on that day. So stay tuned. Um, so this idea of, of this middle ground and being open meant that I had to let go of some of the preconceived notions that I had. So naturally, my mind wanted to drive this whole thing, right? It's like, let's plan this whole thing out. Let's go ahead and make sure that everything is perfect. And the truth is, is that there are some things that are absolutely not perfect. <laughs> There's technology, which we know about, right? Things crash. There are bugs. There are errors. Those things happen. Things malfunction. You have to restart your computer. Um, that's common, but it's also true for our brains. Our brains are also totally not perfect. And for me, that was a big blow to my ego at first, to realize that my brain could not hold everything. If I made all of these big plans for my life, even if they were small plans, um, there was still this notion of, wow, I should keep this all in my head. I can manage that. I got this, right? It's totally not true. My brain cannot hold all of this stuff. So what I did is I started by getting all this stuff out on my absolute favorite tool in the world as a UXer, Post-its. Post-its are awesome. I bankroll 3M every month. Um, but really what I did is I took a big stack of Post-its and said, okay, I'm gonna write down all the stuff I've had in my head, all the ways that I wanna be in the world, all the things that I want to do, goals, projects, everything, just get it all out. And that is where I started with it. So I had a pretty good stack of Post-its there at first, admittedly. Then from there, it felt like the next logical thing to do was group these things in some way, as you do with UX and Affinity diagrams. And it sounded simple, just set your intentions. Set out what you wanna do, and that's it, and that's the end of the talk, right? But no, 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 it's not. Um, I had one problem with this. I didn't know how to really define an intention. And that sounds silly because you know, we hear the phrase like good intentions and stuff like that. That happens all the time, right? We hear these things. But I wasn't quite sure how that could relate to the work that I was doing with these post-its. So thankfully, there's a person by the name of Jess Lively who has done research on this. She's actually studied this for about 10 years. And I love the way that she defines an intention. The way she says it is, she says, I found a true, that a true intention is enduring, flexible, and communicates personal values. And man, I love this for so many reasons. It's also a list of three, so that makes me happy as a grammar snob. Um, but really the idea that you can be shooting towards something, but you know it might change over time, but your personal values are still embodied in what you're saying and what you're doing. Like that was really big for me. That set a focus for me. And again, a framework for looking at these post-its that I put together. So with this in mind, I took my stack of post-its and sorted them out um, a little bit. And I came up with about uh, you know, 12 or 18 post-its or so um, that ended up being something I could consider an intention. So there are things that you see up there like always believe in myself, be gentle, be present, love all of my parts, which is really hard for me, uh, charge into fear, which man, I'm still working on. These are some of the things that I came up with. And I was like, yeah, this, this is what I wanna do. This is how I wanna be in the world. And then the next thing I did, as, as you do when you're doing analysis, is cluster the things together. Um, so I got to a point where I had four main buckets, and man, there's four again, huh? Uh, four main buckets of things that lined up with intentions of my life. So what I did is I put some of these under one another, and I really ended up with the three that you see up top. Be gentle, be present, and be strong. And so for me, those are my three key intentions in my life. Now you also see there's show how I love others over there too. Um, I actually moved things around quite a bit after this and that ended up being under um, be present as well just because I felt that wasn't a strong enough statement to be up at that intention level, right? Because it didn't really meet that criteria that we were talking about just a moment ago. So that's where I started with it. And I had this up, you know, got a nice big wall on my basement uh, and just put all these things up there and came back to it occasionally, you know, and, and really reviewed these things and made sure that everything I started to do really lined up with these intentions as well. So let's talk about how that went, the execution. So by far the most important thing that we are trying to do as designers is do work that really matters, right? We wanna do things that make a difference in the world, either for ourselves, our family, friends, people we don't know, people who need our help. That's important to us. 
So for me, lining this up and making it square was also very important. Really what I wanted to do was make sure that the things that I was doing during the course of a day or a week or a month or what have you lined up with what I intended and, and the way I wanted to be in the world, my intentions. And then beyond that, there were goals, of course. There were goals that kind of sat between that. So I had my intentions up top, then my goals, then my projects. The typical example that I use in this is uh, clean the garage which sounds like a dreadfully boring task overall, right? I don't want to clean out the garage, that's boring. Um, but if it's something that I have, have to do and want to do, I want to see where it lines up with everything. So cleaning out the garage by itself, that's more of a project, right? That's not really a goal. Thinking about what Donna was saying about the story, that's not really something that I'm aspiring toward, right? The aspiration that I'm going towards there is more like, oh, I want to have a nice and neat garage and also have a place that you know, my family can use to store stuff. Like That's a very laudable goal, um, but it's not a project. Like The project is going ahead and cleaning out the garage. Um, another one is yoga. Um, this, you know, thinking about those labels and identity might not surprise some of you to think about that I've, I've tried yoga before. And a couple of years ago, that was a really big deal for me. Um, but it wasn't something that ultimately stuck. And it wasn't a goal for me at first because the goal was really to kind of get connected with myself and body and mind and all that good stuff. And so yoga was just one of those projects overall. So when it didn't work out, I didn't feel too bad about it. Um, I have a little tinge of regret, I have to admit, but in general, felt like, well, I did that, it didn't work out, but I still have those goals and intentions in mind when I'm doing all of this work, okay? Pretty important stuff. Now, when it comes to things like cleaning out the garage, it's important to keep things small or any kind of project, really. Um, this is where I borrow liberally from getting things done by David Allen. Um, it is an excellent system, and I'll talk about that in a second. But it really helped me think about projects in a new way. Cleaning out the garage, fine example. We'll continue with that. It's big. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. And what David Allen encourages is breaking these things down into the next physical action that you can accomplish. So in the case of cleaning out the garage, first thing I have to do is put it on my calendar. Like that's step one. I have to devote some time to it. Then I have to go out to the garage, right? Then after that, I have to sort things into piles for keep, donate, and sell. Then from there, I have to take the donating stuff over to Goodwill. Then I have to trash and recycle the other stuff. And then I have to find a spot to keep everything else. And then I have to maybe buy some stuff to organize the garage. It's kind of a journey map, right? It's kind of all these little steps and all these things that go into this project, which feels like just one thing to do, but it's actually like 10 to 12 things. And so when it comes to organizing this stuff, the next smallest step is what you really need to focus on because that will get you toward that project's end and what that end state is gonna look like. Because if I just keep cleaning out the garage on my list all the time, it's not gonna get done because <laughs> I know there's a bunch of stuff that goes into it that I'm not actually being honest with myself about. So it's about being honest with yourself and breaking that out and being appropriate with it too. Now I have another confession to make to y'all. That, uh, that intention wall I had up, well, that was really great and all, but um, I did it and then I kind of walked away from it for like a month. <laughs> it was in my basement. It wasn't in my line of sight every day. It wasn't something that I was seeing regularly. And that was a failure on my part. So I tried, you know, I tried taking a photo of it and then keeping it with me and having it on my phone as a background. That didn't work out either. Ultimately what I did is I brought it into my to-do app which is called things, um, and have those as, as big areas of responsibility, which you don't need to be concerned about. But it's basically in the app all the time. It's there for me when I open it up. So I see those intentions every day. Now, when I'm looking at my daily to-do list, they are there, I cannot ignore them. That's worked a lot better for me because if we let these things fall out of our sights, they become less important to us. Again, our brains are not perfect, so let's aid them where we can. And it's also super important not to get too hung up on the tools. I spent a lot of time looking at to-do apps and figuring out which one was gonna be best for me. And it's super easy to get hung up on this because there's so many comparison charts and articles and here's what's best for you and here's what you should use. Like there's so much of that. And it's very easy to get wrapped up in the tools, but we have to be mindful of what we're looking to get out of it too. I'd started using things as an app, it made sense to me. I was, I was always like, man, I should use OmniFocus because everybody else uses OmniFocus and it's cool. 
um, as far as to-do list apps go. Um, and so I had that pull, but I had to realize, no, things actually works for me. So I'm just gonna use that. If I outgrow the tool later, fine, I'll get a new tool. It won't be the end of the world. Geeking out about this stuff, though, is totally fine, by the way. You have total license to do that. All right, so thinking about these tools and structures and executing on these projects and making them happen and kind of being visible and present with them all, let's talk a little about feedback. Sometimes when we're doing these things in our lives, we don't really know where they're gonna end up. Small steps might lead to bigger things later. Big things might end up not being that big after all. And it's something that we really don't get perspective on until much, much, much later, if at all. So it's important for us to really look for those patterns in our lives, really see what's happening in a given situation, and see if it's something that's familiar to us, if it's something that we've done before, and start to, again, question why, taking in some of that stuff from the research phase and bringing it into the feedback phase too. Okay, just noticing those patterns first. So, the date was uh, January 31st, 2010. And uh, I was in my kitchen. I was cooking up a new recipe and a new skillet that I got in that day. It was a recipe for uh, Thai spicy chicken, and I was super excited about it. It was going really well. And I don't know, about 4.30, 5 o'clock at night, the phone rings. And my wife is there too. And she answers the phone. And I can tell it's pretty serious. Like, it's a heavy call. She comes in the dining room, starts jotting down some notes. And I'm overhearing this stuff as I'm cooking. Hangs up the phone. And she says, that was the adoption agency. There was a baby boy born in Florida yesterday. And the birth mother has picked us. And are we interested? And in that moment, in that critical moment, the first place my mind went was to money. I worried about having the financial resources for this. I was like, man, how are we going to afford this? How are we going to do this? Can we do this? And I just worried. I was afraid. And my wife, thankfully, was there and very present in the moment. And she said, no, we've got this. We've been saving up for this. We got this. That's covered. What's most important now is about this, about this boy, about this kid. He needs us. So what do you think? And we got to talking about it, I don't know, for about an hour or so. All the prep time and all the work we had done on getting ready to expand our family. And it came down to this. And in talking through it, um, we got to a conclusion. And I found myself at Meyer, which was the only store open on a Sunday night at 11.30 at night. I was buying a stroller and formula and diapers and the tiniest socks I'd ever seen, like things I didn't know existed. And my wife was booking tickets on Southwest. And the next day, we flew out there to Florida. And the day after that, I met my son. If my wife hadn't been there to help me and give me that immediate feedback in that moment, my life would have been in a very different place right now. It was critical for me to get that feedback from her. So when we're getting feedback, it's super important for us to be selective in it, to really focus on who is giving us this feedback. There are lots of people with opinions out there. It's not bad to hear them, but what we do with them is also very important too. We can't let it run us. Because these guys have a lot to say. These guys have a lot of opinions, right? But we don't have to do everything that they say. We don't have to do anything that they say. So it's super important to get feedback from people that matter most to you and then act on that. So as a result of all of this stuff, what happened? Well, first of all, I'd like to think my interface has improved a little bit. I'm a little more able to talk about this stuff, which is a big step for me. Um, there was one time when I was meeting a new group of folks um, for a, a special interest group, and uh, they, they asked me opinions like, why, well, why, what brought you here? And I actually told them kind of, kind of a bit of my story, and the reaction was, wow, you're open. And that was the first time I'd really ever heard that in my life. I was like, me, open? Come on, I'm an introvert. Um, so that's improved for me. My architecture is more flexible. I'm a little more able to handle this stuff, right? There are things that come my way. I feel I'm a little more capable of handling them, too, the unexpected things, and the expected things, too. Some of this stuff is not going to work. It's totally going to blow up. I'm going to fuck it up, and that's going to hurt. But I'm going to be OK on the other side of it, too. 
I still have to experiment, right? That's a big part of design, is trying something, finding out if it works. It's a huge part of this, too. And I think the other thing, you know, touching on what Donna said, this is a never-ending story, right? This is not finished. It is never going to be finished. Even after I'm dead and gone, what I've done and what I've said in this life is going to carry on with the people that I've connected with, even in small ways. That's pretty profound stuff. That's a pretty big deal. It does not end, which is kind of exciting, too. So we as designers have all of these awesome tools and capabilities, these things that we know and love to make great things. So I encourage us really to apply them to ourselves as well. Again, the four buckets that we walked through today, we walked through research, strategy, execution, and feedback. And that's the structure that we talked about as well. It's a solid one, right? It's repeatable, it's proven, it works. So I encourage all of you, to take these tools and use them and be that change agent you really need and want in your lives. You can do this stuff. You do it every day. You can apply it towards yourself because the most important thing we can do in our lives is design ourselves. That's it. Thank you very much.